We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. So I want to tell you about a hobby I picked up uh, during my sabbatical last year. Last summer, uh, my family and I went, went on a sabbatical and I picked up this hobby of trying to trace my family ancestry on Ancestry.com. And we started, I, I, I decided not only to do my side of the family, but my wife's side of the family too, because this was going to be a gift to my kids. Uh, so they would really understand their origins and their roots and all that stuff. And so uh, in doing this, I learned a lot of really cool things. I was very particular. I, I wanted to make sure that every little factoid that it was recommending was, was valid. So I looked at it from a multiple angles. I wanted to have multiple sources and, and all these things. But a couple of things I learned, one, I learned about like my dad's side of the family uh, tracing all the way back uh, in like into Norway, like I'm a Norwegian, like 25% Norwegian. I already knew that, but I learned a lot more about that. I learned that I had a, a grandfather who passed away while preaching in Sunday school. Yeah, it's in his obituary. It's pretty wild. Um, I, I learned that uh, I, one of my grandfathers is the brother of Daniel Boone. So Squire Boone Daniel Boone's dad is one of my grandfathers. That's kind of cool. I, I learned that. I also learned that William Bradford, do you remember that name from history class? He was like kind of the main leader kind of on the people coming over on the Mayflower. William Bradford and another guy on the Mayflower named uh, uh, George Soule. Both of those guys are grandfathers of mine. That was kind of wild, just like tracing all that back. And I'm thinking the farthest back, by the way, I could trace back was 1559. It was the farthest I was able to trace one line. Do you know that if you took all of your ancestors and you were able to trace every single line back to 1559, just 1559. Do you know how many grandparents you'd be trying to keep track of in Ancestry.com? Eight million. You know, you have two parents and your, your parents have parents, so now you're up to your grandparents, you got four of them, and your great-grandparents, you got eight of them, and you keep doing that all the way back to 1559. You're trying to keep track of eight million different people. So if you're the personality type that likes to have things kind of finished and buttoned up nicely, I do not recommend this hobby at all. <laughs> I remember having stress dreams. Like I'd go to bed thinking I have like a million things I have to verify and it was just, it's not, it's not fun. But it's kind of cool to learn a little bit about your origins, right? The, the places that you've come from because they, they tell you a little bit more about yourself and maybe even answer some questions you've always wondered and things like that. Well, we're going to do that over the next five weeks, but we're going to be talking about all the way back to the beginning, all the way back, right? You have 8 million great-grandparents from 1559, and that number just keeps getting bigger and bigger. But at some point, that tree starts to narrow back down, and you get to the place where there was just one. And it's a really neat thing to kind of research and study. And so today, I have a lot to share, so I need you to listen quickly, okay? Um, origins, the foundational understanding for the rest of scripture. And today we're going to talk about Genesis chapters 1 and 2 of the beginning of time. The beginning of time. Where did time begin? How did all this start? Where did we come from? We're going to go all the way back, way past 1559, all the way back to the beginning. In fact, what I want to share with you today are nine things, nine lessons that you can learn from Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. And so if you got your fill in the blanks, I'm going to go through them pretty quickly. I'm going to spend some time on a few of them, uh, but most of them I'm going to go pretty quick. All right, here's the first thing. Uh, well, before I even get to the first thing, uh, you know, uh, I have this set of gumballs in my office. It's three different jars that have gumballs in them, and that makes me a, a fan favorite amongst our pastor's kids. 
uh, there's always a time where there's always a pastor's kid coming into my office asking if they can have some gumballs. I've had to set some ground rules and saying, listen, you can't come in while I'm meeting with someone, okay? Uh, uh, Lily Ferrer is the worst. I don't know if you know little Lily. She'll come in and say, can I have a gumball? And I say yes. And she goes and she opens up one of the jars and she pulls out her shirt. I left for like a week vacation a couple weeks ago, and I came back, and those jars were empty. She cleaned me out. So I've set a rule now. Listen, you can have two gumballs if you tell me a Bible verse that you've, rem- that you've memorized. And so this, uh, oh, hi, Lily. As I'm t- <laughs> so Lily is sitting here on the front row. Um, so Lily comes into my office the other day and says, can I have a, a, a gumball? I said, you can have two, but you got to say a Bible verse. And she said, Genesis 1-1. She started at the very beginning. And so I expect the next time you come in, I'm going to get Genesis 1-2. And we're going to work our way through the whole thing together, all right? So here's, here's Genesis 1-1. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's the very first verse in your Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, you might be wondering, what does this word uh, beginning mean? Like, when, when was the beginning? At what point in time was this verse appropriate? In the beginning of time. Well, I want you to understand there's a couple different ways to look at this. Some people will believe that in the beginning, if you have a, what we call a young earth theology, you would say the earth is really only about 6,000 to 8,000 years old. And so you'd have a young earth perspective. And then other people would say, well, no, I believe that the earth is millions or billions of years old. And that would be kind of an old earth theology. And there are Christians on both sides of this argument. And there's really kind of eight different arguments. There's other things in between all that. And so you might be thinking, well, the the focus, I want to know, Pastor Matt, do you have a perspective on this? Well, if you've been around this church for a little while, you know I have a thought on this subject. And I'm going to share that with you, but I'm not going to do it quite yet. And here's why. Because the, the important part of this verse isn't the word beginning. It's not, it shouldn't make you wonder in the beginning. Well, when was the beginning? The important part of this verse is in the beginning, God. God is the important part of this verse. And what it tells us is that in the beginning of all things, uh, God existed. So here's your first thing I want you to know about. Number one, God exists and created all things. That's one of the things you're going to learn from Genesis chapters one and two, that God exists and created all things. It's one of the first things God wanted to reveal about himself to you is, hello, I am here. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, what's interesting is in the natural world, uh, when we think of the natural world, we mean that everything that has to follow the natural rules of science and order, uh, you have like these, you know, we have natural and we have supernatural. Well, if you are a person who subscribes to just the natural world, you don't believe in anything supernatural, I believe that you have a problem because you have to explain how... Everything that we see and touch and and think and all the things that are going on in this room, how all of this came to be, and you have to explain it using the natural rules of, of science and logic and reasoning and all those things. You have a major problem because at some point you're going to get to a place where you're like, okay, well, uh, there, was this, there was this explosion. Okay, well, where did the things that, that crashed into each other, well, they came from, there was this cloud. Okay, well, where did this cloud come from? And eventually you get to a point where your, your own ideology of trying to explain everything in a natural sense is going to cause some major problems, because the natural world can't explain it. But if you believe in supernatural, I believe you can. You see, in the natural world, something can't just come into existence. We understand that things don't just pop into existence using only the natural laws of science. That would break all the laws of science, physics, logic. We all understand that something can't come from nothing. So if you deny the existence of any supernatural force, anything outside of these natural laws, you have a major problem. You can't explain how something came from nothing. Your own viewpoint breaks down very quickly. And so that's why I tell people I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. 
I don't have enough faith to believe that we can somehow explain how everything that is now came to be without some sort of influence of a supernatural power outside of time, space, and matter. Instead, I have faith that there must be something, or in my case, someone outside of everything that we experience naturally that created it all, and we call that person God. And by the way, before I get into that a little bit more detail, have you ever noticed that when you create something, it comes with the rights of ownership? If you create something, you own the rights to that thing. It's yours. You created it, right? Well, if we believe that God created all things, that he exists and created all things, well, then we understand that God is in charge of all that he's created. He's the owner of it all. Here's the second thing I want you to see that we're still going to get out of Genesis 1.1 is, is number two, is creation is compatible with science. Creation is compatible with science. Now, some of you might scratch your head on this one and say, oh, hold on. I understand that you can either lean into faith or you can lean into science, but the two don't go together. There's no way to overlap these two ideas. You either follow science or you follow this, this uh, ideology of faith. The truth is that you can believe in both. In fact, if God created all things, God created science. He created this tool that we have to actually understand how he made what he made. He gave us access to be able to study and learn how everything fits together that God put together. And that's something that we understand that that creation is compatible with science. In fact, let me show this to you in kind of one really cool way. A 19th century scientist, his name was Herbert Spencer. I'm going to quote him for a moment. He said this, everything knowable can be categorized in five different ways. Time, force, action, space, and matter. Anything that can be understood or known in the natural world can be put into one of these five categories. What's really cool is that in the very first verse of the Bible, God leans into this scientific truth that everything knowable can be categorized into five different ways, time, force, action, space, and matter, and he put it all in verse one. You ready for this? Let let me show this to you on the screen. In the beginning, what do we call that? Time. God. Well, I'm going to say that's, I don't know any more powerful force in my life than the power that God has. Created, there's your action verb, the heavens, that space, and the earth. That's matter. There you go. Time, force, action, space, matter. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And this is just one small example to say, uh, if anyone has ever told you that science and and creation or science and faith don't go together, that you can't have both, they're wrong. And I want you to understand that. Creation is compatible with science. The other thing that I want you to know as we're talking about science is one of the really cool things about God is, is the Bible says he created everything out of nothing. There's actually a Latin phrase that is used in theological circles. It's ex nihilo. It means out of nothing. And so one of my hobbies that I enjoy uh, on a regular basis, pr- pretty much every weekend I'm working on a table of some sort. I like to take solid wood dining room tables that other people think are trash. You know, maybe they're, the veneer is scratched or somebody took a hot plate and set it on there and there's like this milky white thing on there and there, someone did crafts on this side and it's been out in the weather. So it's just, I don't know, it doesn't look like anything anyone would want in their house. So they're ready to throw it out. Well, I'm like, I'll take it. And I like to take that table and I sand it down until I'm at a fresh layer of wood and I put new stain on it and five coats of polyurethane on it when I sand it between each coat. And at the end, it looks better than new. I love this, this project. But here's the deal. I didn't create what I created out of nothing. I created what I created out of a table that already existed, that was already there, present. In fact, the guy who made the table, he didn't create the table out of nothing. He had to have some planks of wood and some glue and some, some you know, uh, screws and bolts and all the things that were necessary. He had to have some materials and some uh, woodworking shops and all. Uh, to put this whole thing together, he didn't create it out of nothing. Well, we believe that God created everything 
that we know in the natural world out of nothing supernaturally. Another thing I want you to understand is that evolution, the concept of evolution, evolutionary science, if you will, is just a theory. In fact, if, if a, a, a teacher, you know, professor, anyone is being honest with you, they're going to say that evolution, the concept of evolution, they should use the word evolutionary theory because it's just a theory. It hasn't been proven and yet somehow within our school systems, evolution can be taught as if it's like some sort of scientific fact. And yet you want to teach any version of, of a creation account that comes from God's word. And they will say, hold on, that's a faith-based system. And what we need to understand is that both require an incredible element of faith because neither can be proven scientifically. I can't prove to you that out of nothing, supernaturally came something. Just like someone who believes in evolutionary science has a really hard time to explain in the natural world how something came from nothing. Both are theories and technically unprovable. Even Darwin himself used the word. In fact, when he was creating and writing his book, trying to explain this process of evolution, as he was writing, he was hoping that at some point in the, in the future, there would be enough factual fossil evidence that would be able to prove his theory and it would no longer be a theory that it would become proven. He was hoping, in fact, he wrote that he was going to write the book anyway, you ready for this? By faith. By faith that at some point in the future we'll have enough d data, we'll have enough fossil evidence and we'll see one species become another species. There's a curator at the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago. His name's Dave Robb, and this is what he says about that. We are now 120 years after Darwin, and the knowledge of fossil records has been greatly expanded. We now have a quarter of a million fossil species, but the situation hasn't changed much. We now have fewer examples of evolutionary transition than we had in Darwin's time. In other words, all the research that's happened over 120 years, they've gone backwards. It's important to know that. There's also this, um, an argument in, for creation that's called the teleological argument. And this argument basically says this, anything with a design must have a designer. That sounds pretty logical, right? When you woke up this morning and you decided what shirt you were going to put on, there wasn't a moment that you thought, you know what, that shirt wasn't there yesterday. It just created itself out of nothing. Or you didn't think that some other person just saw it, that it just appeared out of nowhere, and then they grabbed it and put it in JCPenney for you to buy, right? Like, you understand that your shirt had someone put it together. They stitched it together. They printed something on it. They sold it to you. It had a designer, and we understand that just using logic that you are very intricately designed and therefore must have a designer. And we understand, therefore, that really if you want to argue, is creation more in line with science? Uh, I mean, creation is incredibly in line with science. Creation is compatible with science. Most people believe that all this kind of came about by a cosmic accident that they can't explain naturally. But like I said, I believe that takes more faith. All right, let's get to verse 2. Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, it says, The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. There's a couple things we can learn from this verse. Here's the first thing I want you to see. Number three in your notes is creation involved the whole trinity. Creation involved uh, God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. They were all present at this moment of creation, all involved in this. In fact, the word God that's used here is Elohim. And Elohim, that I and that M on the end of Elohim, it actually makes it plural. We understand that God is referred to in a plurality in this moment. God, plural. It doesn't mean there's multiple gods. There's one God that has eternally existed as three separate persons. Let me show this to you. In John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, in the beginning, the Word, that's 
you do a word study on this, you'll realize this is Jesus. We're talking about Jesus. In the beginning, Jesus already existed. The word was with God and the word was God. In other words, God's word says that Jesus was there at the beginning. And not only was he with God, he was part of the Trinity of God. Colossians 1.16 says, For through him, we're talking about Jesus again, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. Through Jesus Christ, all things were created. Jesus was there at the beginning. And then here in our Genesis 1-2, it says, The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. What does that mean? The Holy Spirit was also present in this process. So there we are, the, the, this this. Verses 1 through 2, we've covered a lot of ground. You ready? Genesis 1, verse 3. We're now still in the first day of creation. It says, then God said, let there be light. And there was light. Just looking at verse 3, here's what I I think we should be able to glean from verse 3. Is number 4, God is incredibly powerful and good. He's incredibly powerful and he's incredibly good. And we see right here in Genesis 1-3, God said, let there be light. He spoke with his mouth and then there was light. There's a moment, uh, it usually happens about once a day, where I get to walk into my house and I get to feel very powerful, right? Especially if it's nighttime and all the lights in the house are off. I walk into that side entrance door. I come into my house and I say, Alexa, I'm home. And all the lights in the family room turn on, the lights in the kitchen turn on, the lights in, and I just, man, it's just in a moment, I just speak with my mouth, and the house obeys. (laughs) It's incredible. Now, clearly, uh, I'm not walking in the house saying, let there be light, and actually fulfilling anything through my power. It's a bunch of technology that God created, by the way, right? And and here, and I'm not, some of you are like, wait, you're saying God created Alexa. That's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying everything that we have It's from God's creation, right? And and God is the one who was able to look at his creation on day one and say, let there be light. And then there was. God is incredibly powerful. And he's incredibly good. Incredibly good. Let me tell you more about this concept of good. Why why do I get good out of this? Well, first in Hebrew, in Hebrews uh, chapter 11, verse 3, it says, by faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. By faith, we believe that everything that exists in the entirety of the universe, the beginning of time, that it all was formed by God speaking it and commanding it to happen. And then it says, and what we uh, now see did not come from anything that can be seen. That's that ex nihilo, that everything came from nothing at God's command. But then in verse 4, if we're talking about this concept of good... It says, and God saw that the light was good. And then he separated the light from the darkness. You know, what you're going to notice throughout the entire creation account is that as God creates what he creates, he looks at what he's made on each day and he says, it is good. He keeps calling his creation good. In fact, as he goes all the way through the creation account, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. In fact, there's one spot in scripture where he switches and he says, it is very good. Do you know what he created when he said it's very good? Yeah, if I'm, if I'm being honest with you, okay, there's actually one place in the creation account where God says that it's not good. And it's right after he created Adam. Right? He creates Adam, the first man, and he looks at what he's made, and he says, it is not good for man to be alone. And then he creates Eve, and then he looks at what he's made, and he says, it is very good. Women, you get credit for that part. (laughs) Here's number five. Nine things that we learn from Genesis chapters 1 and 2. Creation gives us a proper understanding of time. Creation gives us a proper understanding of time. If we look at verse 5, it says, God called the light day and the darkness night. And evening passed and morning came, marking the first day. You're going to notice there's the word day is used twice 
in this verse behind me. The word day in Hebrew is the word yom. All right, so if you go back and look at the original Hebrew, uh, the word yom is used here. And just like in Hebrew, the way uh, we use the word day in English, day can mean three different things, can't it? Think about this for a minute. Sometimes when we say the word day, we're just talking about light, right? We say, hey, uh, I'm going to go out uh, today, but I'm going to come back tonight. What do we mean? That day is the time, that like 12-ish hour period of time where the sun is hitting your side of the globe. We call that day sometimes, and we call the other part of the hours night. So sometimes we're talking about a 12-hour period of time. Another time we use the word day, we're talking about an undefined amount of time from the past, right? Uh, You might have said this before, back in my day. And, And just like in Hebrew, there's times where the word day is used like that, back in that yom, back in this undisclosed amount of time. So that could be the way yom is meant to be used here. Uh, The third kind is the most obvious uh, way that yom is sometimes translated, and it's a a literal 24-hour period, right? We understand that a day, as we, as we talk about it today, is, is, you know, one 24-hour period of time. We call that a day. So the question is, what day is being used here? It says, God called the light day. That one's pretty obvious. That's the first one, right? That's that 12-ish hour period of time where light is hitting your side of the, the planet, and God created light and called it day. And then the other side, he's calling night. And then it says, and evening passed. And morning came, marking the first yom. Now, the the question about that yom, that day, is is it talking about a 24-hour period of time? Or is it talking about, uh, uh, you know, are we young earth, 6,000, 8,000 years old, based on the genealogies of Scripture and understanding how, was this a literal 24-hour period of time? Or was this about ages of time? Is this an age of time? Is the earth millions of years old? Well, I want to tell you my, my perspective. I'm a young earth believer. I believe that the, the, we're talking about literal 24-hour periods of time that God created the earth and the universe and everything in it in six literal days. Let me tell you why I believe that. But before I do, let me say this. If you disagree with me on this, you're wrong. Just kidding. No, no, no. Hold on. <laughs> now, if you disagree with me on this, this is not an area at this church that we consider an essential matter of faith, right? You don't have to get this exactly right to be a follower of Jesus who's one day going to spend eternity with other brothers and sisters in Christ in heaven. This isn't that kind of a matter. So you can disagree with me. You can say, oh, I think this translates differently and I understand this in a different way. And we can still be brothers and sisters in Christ and love each other. We're not going to break fellowship over this. I do still want to share with you my view and why I believe it's a literal 24-hour period of time. Some people would hear that and be like, wait, you believe that God literally created everything in six days? And I would say, yeah. And what took him so long? (laughs) Like why God? In just one moment, everything would have been created, right? So why, why would he even done the, the 24-hour period of time thing? And I, I believe the reason why, and first of all, one of the things to know is the word yom, anytime it's mentioned with a number, so yom one, yom two, yom three, it's always in, in every other part of the Bible, it's always referring to a literal 24-hour period of time. That's one of the reasons why I believe this is a literal understanding of time, a 24-hour period. But another thing to understand here. Uh, is, is God is, is creating in this moment our understanding, a proper understanding of time. Uh, uh, an understanding of uh, what a 24-hour period looks like. And he's establishing for us, uh, why did God not create everything in one day? Why did he not create it in one instant? Why did he do it over six days? He's teaching us how and, and what it looks like to, to have a work week and then to take a day and rest. He's modeling that for you and I. So that we know what it looks like in a, in a typical work week to have that time of rest and to have that time of work. And so God is working all this out, in my, in my opinion, in a literal six 24-hour periods. Now, by the way, some people will look at this verse and say, well, this verse says that God created the light on day one. But if you keep reading down, if you've been like reading ahead, on day four is when he creates the sun. 
We think, well, what, that doesn't seem to, to line up. That seems to be a problem. Your Bible is a little wonky, right? But it's not. If you really understand, one of the things we know about God is God describes himself as basically perfect light. In 1 John 1, it actually says in verse 5, God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. And so, believe it or not, you can understand this creation account. Uh, what did, what did, think about this for a second. What did God create on day one? Most people will say light. God created light on day one. God said, let there be light, right? That's, that's what it was. But if you actually read back a little bit, you understand that in the beginning, on day one, I believe that God also created the heavens and the earth. So understand this, that on day one, he was really busy. He created this thing that we call the earth. The Bible says that it was formless and empty, that it had no shape, that the spirit was hovering over the waters. And then also said that he created the heavens, which in this case would be uh, the entirety of the universe. It was all void and empty. There wasn't anything in it filling it yet. It was just, uh, there was the earth and everything else. And then he created light on day one, okay? So understand that. So if, if on day one there was light and there was a daytime and a nighttime, but there was no sun, how is that possible? Believe it or not, I believe that God for the first three days of creation was the, the source of natural light on this world. He allowed his light to be seen in a natural sense and to provide that source of light on day one, two, and three of his creation until he created the sun to take over that job. Let's keep, let's keep reading. Nine things that we learn from Genesis 1 and 2. Number five, creation gives us a proper understanding of time. I already gave you that one. Uh, here, here, here let's, let's read Genesis 1, verses 6 through 7. It says, Then God said, Let there be a space between the waters to separate the waters of the heavens from the waters of the earth. And that is what happened. God made this space to separate the waters of the earth from the waters of the heavens. And God called the space sky. And evening passed and morning came, marking the second day. So one of the things you notice is the earth already exists coming into day two. And the universe, the heavens already exist coming into day two. So what he creates on day two is this atmosphere, this, this protection layer around the earth to separate the sky, the space that uh, uh, human life is now possible, that there's breathable air and water to drink and all the things that are going to be necessary to sustain life, that that space, our atmosphere is separated from everything in outer space. That's what he created on day two. See, God created this, and he created just what he needed, the canvas necessary to sustain life. Let's keep reading. In verse 9, it says, Then God said, Let the waters beneath the sky flow together into one place, so dry ground may appear. And this is what happened. God called the dry ground land, and the waters seas. And then God saw that it was good and then God said, let the land sprout with vegetation, every sort of seed-bearing plant and trees that grow seed-bearing fruit. These seeds will then produce the kinds of plants uh, and trees from which they came. And that is what happened. The land produced vegetation, all sorts of seed-bearing plants and trees with seed-bearing fruit. Their seeds produced plants and the trees of the same kind. And God saw that it was good and evening passed and morning came, marking the third day. Again, what I believe is a 24-hour period of time. On, on day three, he, he separates the land from the water, and he puts this vegetation on the land. It talks about these seed-bearing plants, that he, he, he created the plants. They already had seeds in them. They had everything they needed to already reproduce life and to grow and thrive and all these things. And to me, it really kind of brings about a, one of the most important questions I think you can ever ask about the creation account. This is kind of the one question that when anyone talks to me about Genesis 1 and 2, this is the overarching question, and it should be in your mind as well. You ready? Did Adam have a belly button? Now, it might be a weird question. You could think about this from a perspective of, well, he didn't, never had an a, you know, umbilical cord, right? So why would he have a belly button? Or how about this? If you were to go on day, on day three and, and cut down a giant redwood, would you see rings? 
I don't, I don't know technically the answer. The Bible doesn't tell us. I'll tell you what I believe. You know, I be, in order for plants to thrive, for them to grow in this land that God has just created, there actually has to be organic dead material from other plants in that ground. There has to be evidence and a history of plants that once were that are no more in that ground for this new plant to be able to thrive and grow. So I believe, you ready for this? I believe Adam had a belly button and the trees had rings. I believe that as those mountains came up out of the water, all those tectonic plates did what your, your science book might say takes millions of years, that God did it all in one day and just created all this in, in an instant. That's what I believe. Not a, not a hill we're dying on, but that's what I believe. Here's, here's a, why I bring all that up. Number six, creation provided the foundation to sustain life. Creation provided the foundation to sustain life. Genesis 1, if we keep reading in verse 14, it says, Then God said, Let lights appear in the sky to separate the day from the night. Let them be signs to mark the seasons, days, and years. And let these lights in the sky shine down on the earth. So that is what happened. Here's the seventh thing I want you to see with the time I have left. Here, here you go. Number seven, everything was created in relation to earth. Everything that was made, as you go throughout this creation account, you're going to see that it was created in relation to this earth that we live on. I'll show you that again in, in verse uh, 16 through 19. It says, God made two great lights, the larger one to govern the day on earth and the smaller one, which is the moon, to govern the night here on earth. He also made the stars while he's at it. And while I'm at it, I'm going to make some other stars out there too. God set these lights in the sky to light what? The earth. To govern the day and night on earth. And to separate the light from the darkness on earth. God saw that it was good and evening passed and morning came marking the fourth day. If you think about it, at the end of the day, who benefits from the sun and the moon? Like everything God created. He created this sun and this moon in perfect relation to exactly where they need to be and where, where we're exactly where we're situated in the universe. All of that was done intentionally to create a, a canvas where life is sustainable. Without the tides and without the, the plants that, that follow the, the rhythm of the sun and the moon and our bodies that follow this rhythm of the world spinning at exactly the rate it is, the, the going around, uh, rotating around the sun at exactly the rate it is, tilted at exactly the way it's tilted. All of these things are done very intentionally so that life can be sustained and you can live here. God created everything with this earth as the kind of the in, in relation to the earth. Keep that in mind for, for just a moment. You know, even things like, do you know that the earth is 79% oxygen, 20% nitrogen, and 1% other random gases? Do you know that that's exactly what is necessary to sustain life? In fact, if some people would say, well, what if it were like 50% oxygen and 50% nitrogen? Well, if you really want to see what a big bang looks like, light a cigarette in that environment and you'll find out. Like, it just won't work. God created everything perfectly for him to sustain life here for us, his ultimate creation, which we're going to get to in just a moment. Let's read about the fifth and sixth day all together. And for these next uh, six verses I'm going to read, 20 through 25, what I want you to do is every time you see the word kind, K-I-N-D, uh, just make a mental note of how many times you see this word, all right? Genesis 1, verse 20, it says, Then God said, Let the waters swarm with fish and other life. Let the skies be filled with birds of every kind. God created 
great sea creatures and every living thing that scurries and swarms in the water and every sort of bird, each producing offspring of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply. Let the fish fill the seas and let the birds multiply on earth. And the evening passed and the morning came, marking the fifth day. And then God said, let the earth produce every sort of animal, each producing offspring of the same kind. Livestock, or livestock, uh, small animals that scurry along the ground, and wild animals. And that is what happened. God made all sorts of wild animals, livestock, and small animals, each able to produce offspring of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. 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 He made it exactly the way he wanted it. It leads us to number eight. Creation shows us an established order among God's creation. Creation shows us an established order among God's creation. You know, there is still today not a single iota of evidence of one kind, one species of animal ever becoming another species animal. There's zero. Uh, you can find all sorts of evidence of what I would call uh, microevolution. Uh, you can take this berry and they all have the same basic genetic ability to be able to, you can combine them. In fact, we've done this. We've made this new berry called a boysenberry, right? You can take different breeds of dogs that are of the same kind, and you can make, uh, you can find this microevolution where you create this new dog breed and then sell it to people for $2,000, right? <laughs> you can do that. But there is zero evidence of macroevolution. There's all sorts of evidence of, of evolution that happens uh, vertically, but you're never going to see a kind or a species jump horizontally into a different number of chromosomes in the DNA. There's zero evidence of, and this is really unfortunate, by the way, there's zero evidence of a cat ever becoming a dog. <laughs> that would be cool. That would be like, I, I'm okay with it, but it's never happened. So creation shows us an established order among God's creation. That vertical, that micro, yes, that happens. But a macro, a horizontal jump from one species or kind to another, it has never happened. There's zero evidence of it ever happening. In fact, you, you find someone who, who's adamant that, that we came through evolutionary science, I want you to say, find me one piece of evidence of one species ever becoming another species. They won't have anything. God created everything in a precise order, and he called it good, and that's because it is good. All right, speaking of making good things, do you know his greatest creation of all kind, of all time, of all the kinds, is you. In Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27, it says, Then God said, Let us, that's the Trinity, Make human beings in our image to be like us. That's again, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Saying, let us make one bit of creation. He didn't, he didn't create the plants in his image. He didn't create any animals or fish or birds or any. He didn't create anything else in his image. He, there's only one thing in all creation he created in his image. And it's mankind. He says, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and the livestock, and all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. When we talk about, um, let me give you number nine. Number nine is this. You were created in the image of God. You were created in the image of God. If you want to take a little side note, what does being created in the image of God mean? Well, God has three things that he has given to you as a human being that are unique to you. He's given you volition, meaning a will to be able to do things and to decide what you're going to do. He's given you emotion and he's given you intellect. These are three things that are characters of God, characteristics of God that he's given you. And we were able with our volition, our emotion and our intellect, we're free to process our own thoughts. We're free to feel things. And then with those feelings and those thoughts, decide for ourselves what we're going to do. 
And I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Next week, we're going to talk about the beginning of sin. And ultimately, if you know the story, we took the fact that we were beautifully made in a good place, a beautiful place in the image of God. We took the volition, the intellect, and the emotion that he gave us, and we screwed it all up. We're going to talk about that more next week. So what now? What do we do with this? Um, I, uh, normally we would do another song on stage after I'm done preaching, but I went so late. There's a note on the screen saying, no closing song. You went too late. Um, so here's what I want to ask you to do. I want you to, to start asking some hard questions about the origins of you. Where did you come from? I'm not talking about whether or not you had an ancestor on the Mayflower. I'm talking about going all the way back to the beginning of time. What is it that you believe and why do you believe it about where all things have come from? Start asking some hard questions. Start reading. I didn't even get to Genesis chapter 2, which is some people would say it's another recount of the creation account. Believe it or not, I believe that it's really an introduction to the fall of man. The bottom part of chapter 2 is kind of an introduction to chapter 3. But go read this for yourself. That's one thing that God might be prompting you to do today. Another thing that I want to challenge you to think about is to plan to be here for all five weeks of our origin series. Plan to be here to learn more about who you are and where you come from, where all this has come from. And we're going to teach that as we go through Genesis together. Um, I'm really looking forward to this adventure with you. Are you guys excited about this? Let's, uh, let's pray together. God, thank you so much for being so good. Thank you for the opportunities that we've had to open up your revelation, that you've given us this book where you've revealed truth about who you are to us. And not just truths about who you are, but you've even given us insights about where we come from, about how you created everything and, and the history of the world and the, the, the universe and all of it. So as we open up this book over these next uh, five weeks, Father, I pray that you would help us to see clearly who you are and who we are and, how, and who we are in relationship to who you are. God, we thank you for this gift of time in your word together, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.